One of the joys of going through such a long running series like Naruto is watching characters go through various trials and tribulations that they end up overcoming as they embark on their journey to accomplish some grandiose dream. In the case of Sasuke, it was to kill Itachi, and in the case of Naruto, it was to become the Hokage. But one aspect of these journeys that is equally as satisfying, though painful, is the moment along set journey where we watch a character get killed off. Sometimes the death that occurs happens before a character even gets to finish their character arc. It highlights the cruelty of life that sometimes dreams and promises they don't get fulfilled, like say Nobar from Jujutsu Kaisen. And other times characters are killed off after their character has fully served their purpose in the story and their death needs to be done in order to raise the stakes of the stories being told. Like say Jiraiya dying at the hands of the Six Pass of Pain. Like say Kikyo from Inuyasha. When death in the series is done right, it leaves readers and viewers going into a well-smart situation where they end up bargaining against the series trying to justify how a character could have lived or how things could have been turned out different had they lived which in turn proves that the mangaka accomplished two very important things number one they managed to create a character that fans were super passionate about and number two they managed to pull off that well smart situation and making fans try to rewrite the death itself which means that it was either emotionally painful to experience or it was an unexpected experience and naruto is no different which is why in today's naruto explain video i want to go over what I feel are the 10 saddest deaths in the entire Naruto franchise and to put a spin on it I not only want to look at the impact of the deaths but I want to do something new I want to look at the life lessons that each of these deaths gives to us as readers and viewers because anybody can list out what they think are the top 10 saddest deaths and go boo-hoo and sell you all this hype and etc I want to go deeper beneath the surface so for this video I'll be using both the manga which longtime viewers know I prefer the manga over the anime by a wide margin and in some cases i will be referring to anime specific stuff where there are some deaths that didn't necessarily happen in the manga so all three naruto anime they will be on the table so naruto naruto shippuden boruto naruto next generations as always leave your list for the 10 best deaths in the entire naruto franchise down below so starting things off at number 10 i'm gonna go with a bit of an unexpected death but one i strongly believe deserves to be on this list which is asuma saratobi's death i I know the knee-jerk reaction is going to be to start typing up a storm on the keyboard about how Asma is a bum who died in order to avoid paying child support to the baby that Kuro and I was carrying inside of her, but I do think Asma's death goes unappreciated by a lot of Naruto fans. Back when Asma died in 2006 when Naruto Chapter 327 came out, it was a really big deal because up until that point in the story, while the Akatsuki, they were a big deal in terms of we knew every shinobi in that group was someone of an s rank Kage level they weren't truly in possession of a lot of heat at that point in time. Sure, Itachi and Kisame a couple years ago pulled up into Konoha and they took down Kakashi and two of the Konoha elite Joni, but while they did leave an impression on fans, the group as a whole got blunted following the death of Gar, who was brought back to life by Chiyo using her forbidden jutsu to revive him. The stakes got raised, but the fact that someone was brought back from death, it took out some of the sting in the Akatsuki as a whole because up until that point, like Chiyo, she was a relatively new character so it doesn't hit you the same as if Gar would have stayed dead. By killing Asma, it added another threat level to the Akatsuki. We got the benefit of a long term death in a character dying in a battle where the stakes were progressively increasing as we saw the normally sharp Shikamaru unable to come up with a plan to take down Hidon which is even more heartbreaking when you realize that Asma had put so much faith in Shikamaru who had previously in the Sasuke retrieval arc almost gotten his entire team killed. This time it was now Shikamaru seeing firsthand what happens when you fail that mission, just as his father had told him, just as Tamari had told him. There was no saving Asma once he died, and part of what made that death so impactful in the beginning is that you could see the narrative highlighting that there was still a lot of unfinished business for Asma. His team was filled with three very talented young shinobi and Ino and Choji and Shikamaru, but each of them still had a lot of growing to do and lessons to learn from their sensei by this point in the story. Asuma was still nurturing them to become better shinobi, like how he constantly played shogi with Shikamaru and was trying to mold his young mind into seeing the true value of the very villagers that they were tasked with protecting as Konoha shinobi. Asuma knew that Shikamaru had what it took to be Hokage one day. He even told him as much 
on his deathbed, but he needed to learn that the most important person in the village wasn't the Hokage, which was always his answer whenever Shikamaru would be asked who the king was, the most important piece on the shogi board to protect, not realizing it was actually the children of the village. Each member of Team Asuma still had steps left to take that you would ideally want to have that Jonin sensei there to guide them and ease them into the harshness of the shinobi world and guide them into reaching their true potential. With Asuma's death, we saw another cruelty of life, which is that tomorrow isn't promised. Here, we had an expectant father already planning his future with Kurunai and their child, but he never got the chance to be the father and husband that he had promised Kurunai he'd become. That opportunity was ripped out of his hands, which is made more heartbreaking when you look at how the scenes after this, where you have Kurunai dropping down to her knees when she's told that Asuma's dead, and we see Shikamaru watching over a young Mirai as she grows up, and in particular in Naruto chapter 533, we see Mirai Sarutobi being held by Kurunai, with Shikamaru recalling how Asuma entrusted him in guiding his unborn daughter daughter into the future as his daughter's future godfather. Asuma's death reinstilled in the hearts for a lot of fans that Gar was the exception to the rule and that any of our beloved characters who fought against members of the Koski, they could die. And within weeks after this, Kakashi would face off against Hidan and Kakuzu. There was a lot of fear in the fandom at that time that Kakashi might have actually died because all it took was one scratch from Hidan and he could be killed. And he was having to hard carry Team Asuma in that fight because all of them were in over their heads. Asuma's death, it raised the stakes. It gave a lesson on the cruelty of life and gave the Akoski some much needed heat as we saw the good guys actually take a much needed L in the process. At number nine, I'm gonna be going with Zabuzan Haku, another death that I love the writing behind as well as the significance of the death. It would be because of Zabuzan Haku's death that we would see Naruto go from the cliche main character who has this goal of wanting to be Hokage to actually having some real substance behind that goal because it went from wanting to be acknowledged by others to wanting to change the shinobi system itself with Naruto listening to Kakashi state in chapter 33 that shinobi exists to be the tools of value to their home lands and to not be concerned with the reason behind their own existence and upon hearing that naruto declares i don't like the way that sounds i'm gonna create my own ninja way i'm gonna create my own destiny essentially saying without saying so that he planned to change the ninja system when he became hokage with the deaths of zabuza and haku we get introduced to the cruel side of this ninja world that these characters were embarking on their journey into it wasn't just going on missions to find dogs or escorting old men like tazna they were going into real life or death missions as well. The people they are fighting against, they weren't always going to be the cliche bad guys who are the evil for the sake of being evil. Naruto meeting Haku and bonding with them was our chance to see that the people who they would end up fighting in life and death battle, they would be people had they met under different circumstances, they might have ended up being friends with one another. With Haku dying, we saw a noble sacrifice of someone who was dealt a bad hand of cards, but still made the most of it and even found someone precious in his own life to protect and love and still value. Enough so that he gave his own life to save Zabuza from Kakashi Shidori. Through the battle with Haku, we saw each of these combatants, Naruto, Sasuke, and Haku, each through their own different ways, show what that kind of a bond does for someone. Sasuke protected Naruto without thinking, and had that been any other shinobi he faced in that situation who had Haku's ability, Sasuke would have been killed shortly after awakening his Sharingan and saving Naruto from Haku's attack. Naruto showed us a glimpse at the pain of loss when he believed that Sasuke had died and he gave into the power of the Nine Tails, but we saw the conflicting emotions when he realized that the boy he met earlier was the same boy behind the mat, and all of a sudden his enemy now had a face and he was someone that he knew. With Haku dying to protect Zabuza, we saw the sacrifice of life in order to protect life, which in of itself, that's a beautiful message. With Zabuza's life, we saw that even though a shinobi is a tool, the heart of a shinobi still lives on. In particular, their pride still lives on. With Naruto's words breaking through Zabuza's heart and filling him with emotion, Zabuza might have been a tool, one used by Gato to carry out his misdeeds, but like any tool, when you mishandle it and you truly 
truly don't respect that tool that you're using, it can actually kill you. Zabaza was no different than some novice that is holding a gun and not taking it seriously, that the gun can kill someone or even kill themselves and they accidentally shoot themselves in the face while fooling around with it. Gato thought that he could double cross Zabaza with a gang of random thugs, not taking seriously the shinobi he hired as a tool and it ended up getting him killed in the process. Up until that point, Zabaza was seen as this ruthless and cold-hearted killer, being introduced as the guy who wasn't even an academy student but walked into the graduation exam in his village and he killed everyone. He was cold-hearted and merciless, yet in chapter 33, we see him begging Kakashi, his former enemy, to take him next to Haku so he could see his face one last time, touch his cheek, and saying out loud he wished he could go to the same place in the afterlife as Haku in open admission of a dark truth. Zabaza will likely go to hell and Haku would go to heaven. Zabaza's reaction here touches on another important lesson, which is that we have a responsibility to those that we lead who we have influence over. Those who follow us can either be elevated by our words and our actions, or they can be misled and taken down to a path of hell and destruction. Zabaza took Haku and gave him a purpose in life. Yes, yet as he tried to turn him into a killing machine, he saw multiple times throughout the years that Haku was too kind-hearted for the life of a mercenary ninja. Yet Zabaza still continued to keep him at his side, trying to mold him into a perfect weapon form, and the young boy dead at his side was dead because Zabaza's actions led him to that point. Haku was introduced to us as someone who Kakashi looks at and tells Naruto when referring to Haku that there are children Naruto's age or even younger who are stronger than Kakashi. Haku had all the potential in the world. At his time of death, he was already stronger than Kakashi, yet he died before he ever reached his prime. It was the first of a few examples that the series would give us to teach us that some potential never gets fulfilled. Some dreams never get reached because life can end at any moment years before we ever expect it to end. This brings us to the next couple of deaths. Whereas the first two represented the cruelty of life where people die before they get a chance to live up to their potential and find true happiness, the next two deaths we go over are going to represent what happens when someone dies after a lifetime of making some rather questionable decisions and dying with regrets. Both of these shinobi ultimately died because of past decisions that they made coming back to haunt them. At number eight, we have the death of Noiki and Boruto's anime. What I love about this one is that it represents what we just discussed, which is what happens when someone lives for a long time and they end up with some form of regret. Or Noiki, he did die as a hero, battling to save Boruto and Team 7 from Ku, a clone of himself, but what I particularly enjoy about this death is that it builds on that expression that so many of us have heard before, which is that you can't teach an old dog new tricks and that some folks, they're just stuck in their ways. Back when Gar and Anoiki got into it in the Faikage Summit where Gar asked him, when did you forsake himself? And we saw a stubborn old man who thought all of his years and experience made him into someone superior to the younger generation, that they were incompetent going so far as to call the Raikage a brat. Even though the Raikage was the strongest of the Kage assembled during that five Kage summit, maybe not the deadliest, but the physically strongest of all the Kage, at least the ones gathered, because Tsunade is stronger than the Raikage. When Edo Madara fought against the Shinobi Alliance, we saw Anoiki risk his body to protect the younger generation when he tried to stop the meteors. We saw the flashback of how Madara basically gave Anoiki PTSD for life by showing him what overwhelming force looked like when a young Anoiki was challenged by Madara despite the treaty that Hashirama had with the Stone Village, we saw how Anoiki appeared to be turning a corner when he more than once served as a battery pack for the five Kage in the battle with Madara, renewing their fighting spirit at times as they stood up to the natural disaster known as Madara Uchiha. Yet, as is the case with people in real life, sometimes we don't learn our lessons right away. Sometimes it takes us learning them more than once before it ever truly sticks. Sometimes when life smacks us in the face, that character development we just got, it all regresses. In Boruto's anime, we see that Anoiki on the surface level looked as if he was willing to step back and let the next generation shape the ninja world moving forward. His granddaughter had taken over as Suche Kage with her fine self with those slender legs for days that make you want to slide between them. Good lord, someone get that horny bonk meme for me because that slit in that dress got me ready to act up like I was Naruto on his honeymoon when he and Hinata made Boruto. Jokes aside though, it looked like he had taken a step back. Yet the death of his grandson, it had changed him. It had rocked him to his core. He saw such a bright young life being snuffed out when he was killed by 
missing Shinobi that caused him to look at things a lot differently. A man who for decades didn't believe in handing things over to the next generation and trusting the next generation had just lost someone he was taking care of and it led to him seeking out one of the scientists who worked with Amato and Card to create the fabrication, including one that was a clone of himself with the intention to have them fight against Osuski level threats because Anoiki didn't believe that the younger generation would be able to hand out kind of threat despite his granddaughter being fresh off of fighting Momoshiki with the other Kages. He didn't want to risk going through that loss of pain of losing another loved one. In short, in a way, he had once again forsaken himself like Gara said, which led to the birth of the fabrications and it would end up with him dying at the hands of the fabrication clone of himself, Ku, who was trying to kill Boruto, a member of the very young generation that Anoiki was hoping to protect by sending those artificial humans, those clones, into battle to die in the place of the youth, the very kings of the village that Osmo told Shikamaru they had to protect. Anoiki's death shows us that the mistakes of our past, they will always come back to bite us and that if we're blessed enough to live a long life instead of wanting to change the things outside of our control. We should cherish the time that we have with our loved ones. Anoiki wasn't able to trust the next generation and see through his own trauma and it cost him his life, which is similar yet drastically different than the person we have at number seven. At number seven, we have the death of the third Hokage, whereas Anoiki never learned and truly stayed faithful to the lesson of trusting in the next generation. The third Hokage was someone who did learn that lesson and did stick to it as he got older. Yet ironically, also at times didn't actually stick to it. Here was a man who came to power as Hokage during the first Ninja War, the second bloodiest war in the history of the five nations. One that was responsible for the first two generation of Kage dying during that long drawn out war. Here was a man who after that went on to start the second Ninja War War and help provoke the tensions that led to the third ninja war. Two wars that would kill countless shinobi and innocent lives, one of which would lead to Nagato forming the Akatsuki, and Nagato decades later would come into Konoha and destroy the very village that started the second ninja war that killed Nagato's parents. With Hiruzen, we see a similar lesson, that the mistakes of our past come back to bite us in the rear, but we also see an overlooked lesson when it comes to pride. And make no mistake, that sweet old grandpa third Hokage that people love he had a lot of pride and it bit him. The third Hokage's death always hit home a little bit harder for me, but it's not because he left behind a grandson, but instead it's because he didn't have a bench of Hokage candidates inside the village at the time. It was a very human flaw that you have, that I have, that all of us have. The idea that we have unlimited time, that we can put off something until later. We all go through it in our lives at some point. In our youth, we're extremely guilty of it because we don't think we're actually gonna die youth gives us a false sense of immortality yet a lot of us don't truly learn the limited time we have until we lose someone close to us or god forbid we die ourselves to so get personal for you i'll give you a couple examples i went through that a couple years ago with my grandmother i saw her conditioning getting worse and i used to think i'll go over and i'll visit next weekend i'll spend the day with her next weekend even though i could see small signs that her memory is fading away and that she was starting to forget who i was by the time I did go see her, one of my last memories is her freaked out at the sight of me and she attacked me, hitting at me when I tried to hug her. One of my last memories is of her screaming in fear at me, not knowing who I was and hitting me. Shortly after high school, I had an urge to make up with a friend of mine named Scott and I put it out out of pride, not wanting to be the first one to apologize after the stupid fight that we had with somebody that I was very close with and he ended up dying of an overdose at a party. We don't have as much time as we think we do in the third Hokage, he was guilty of this. You don't believe me? Look at this here. Minato died 13 years ago in that timeline. Yet, Hiruzen never developed anyone in the village to take his spot. On one hand, he had in his mind, I'll just get this position to Jiraiya. Jiraiya will come back to the village and be Hokage one day. But Jiraiya was never in the village. He was off chasing after Orochimaru, peeping into bathhouses at women, bathing, giving him an excuse in order to seek inspiration, which is really code for Jiraiya saying, I'm a dirty old pervert. Tsunade wasn't ever considered by Hiruzen based off of the lore that we have in the manga, yet the granddaughter of the first Hokage, she's out there suffering from PTSD, a qualified Hokage candidate, and she was never brought back to the village by Hiruzen. It's something that Orochimaru mocked him for when he was hiding under the disguise of being the fourth Kaze Kage, saying that Hiruzen should have picked the fifth Hokage by now, and then once he was unmasked, he said it once again during their battle. Hiruzen thought, hey, I got more time, despite each day that passed, that 
that head and beard that's full of brown hair on the night when Minato died each day that passed by each year that passed by more white hairs began to pop up on that face more white hairs began to pop up on that head of hair of his it's a big part of what makes his death so tragic to me personally the other thing is obviously dying at the hands of his student and this is one of the few times in this video you'll ever hear me say I appreciate the small touch the anime had and I prefer the anime version of the manga in the anime one of the last things we see from Hirazen is that when he's looking up at Orochimaru and he's got those big glossy eyes that are losing the light behind them and as Orochimaru is shouting at him he sees him briefly as a child again before Hirazen dies implying that the whole time they were fighting this guy might have had a huge mental nerve it goes back to something that I used to hear old folks say to me when I was growing up it doesn't matter how old I get it doesn't matter if I grow out a beard or if I put on some muscle they look at me and some of them still see that little kid who will run around at the summer get togethers trying to talk with grown folks talk about how it's gonna be a politician one day talk about how it's gonna be a writer one day and a lot of their eyes to this day some of them still see me as that little kid here is in look back at Orochimaru the student he always had a soft spot for and in his last moments thought that he was seeing a child again the manga was already heartbreaking but when you realize that here is in could have killed Orochimaru in the past when he experimented on children and got chased out of the village because of it all this could have been prevented but this one takes the pain of the third Hokage's death to another level for me personally it's one of my guilty pleasures when I go back and I look at Naruto deaths and I want to see something sad I'll oftentimes look at this one or I'll look at number one on the list so at number six we have the death of Neji Hyuga now for full transparency because I know that there are some of you guys who are viewers on my first channel Kryptonian saying where I did Naruto content alongside other anime content content before making this Naruto Explained channel to focus solely on Naruto and Boruto. I said before that I loved Neji's death until Kishimoto fixed his mouth after the end of Naruto's manga in 2014 and realized that the reason he killed off Neji was so that he could get an excuse to have Naruto and Hinata end up together. That took Neji's death from being a top two death for me personally to being outside the top five and depending on the day that you ask me, I'll put it outside the top 10. However, taking my feelings out of it, I do think that there's a lot of good here. I love the parallel that exists between Neji dying to protect the main branch and his father dying to do the same thing. However, the reason why I love it is because Neji didn't act out of a sense of duty like his father did, who saw the writing on the wall and knew he had no choice except to go along with the plan to be a replacement for Hiyashi. Because on the other hand, Neji saw Hinata risking her life for Naruto and Neji sprang forward to protect her and he did so by choice. He wasn't forced into into it. Sure, you could argue that when the Tentails attack went through Hinata's body, it probably would have impaled Naruto, but the narrative is there for Neji to have done this because he was thinking about Hinata first. Neji's death was similar to Haku and Asuma's death in that they each teach us that we have a finite amount of time on this earth and that tomorrow is not promised to us, even in our youth. However, the other thing I love about Neji's death is that it marked the first real significant death that we had in the fourth Ninja War. I don't care about all the fodder who died fighting Edo Tensei or died fighting White Zetsu. Them dying moves me about as much as the tears of Konohamaru fans who are upset that he's not taken as a serious character in Boruto. And they got their hopes up for a guy who has used this comedic relief for 99% of Naruto's manga with his only shining moment being when he stunned a pain with the Rasengan he stunned it. He didn't even destroy it. That ain't touching me. Here's the thing. For a whole ass fourth ninja war, we didn't have any deaths of characters who we formed any attachments to. But with Neji dying, this was one that made you go, oh wow. So the new generation, they can be killed off. It was a ballsy move. Anytime you kill children, even if they're teenagers, it hits you in the gut. Though technically speaking, Neji died as an adult since he was 18 when he died. But there's a surprising number of fans who don't realize that Neji, Lee, and Tin Tin, and the Sand siblings are all older than Naruto's classmates, with Tamari being 20 in Naruto Shippuden's war. However, the point still stands though. To see Neji go out like he did, it hit you in the gut because of all the development that he got. From Genma telling him after Naruto beat him in chapter 105 that even a caged bird will get smart enough to try opening up the cage with its beak so it can fly freely again. When Neji is killed, we see him flying through the air to take the attack that would have killed Hinata. The caged bird had finally taken 
and fly it again and he died on his own terms which i found to be very poetic by kishimoto when you look at the symbolism behind that at number five we're going to be going with jiraiya's death and for a ton of years jiraiya's death was the one that if you put a pistol on my head and you told me pick the saddest death in the series i'd have said jiraiya's death because i remember reading those chapters back when they first came out and one week going yeah jiraiya's gonna pull it off this dude gets backed into a corner and manages to get his way out of it the next week to cussing out pain the next week because he has some trick up his sleeve to going wait jiraiya has sage mode he's got these two toads on his shoulders let's go jiraiya is about to do it to jiraiya got hit with those long black rods that we all know that one girl from around the way loved to have penetrator but jiraiya being the guy that he was he took several of them like he was filming only fans content for 2.99 which man my dude can't even sell it for five dollars like holy Jiraiya's death for me personally taught me the lesson of never giving up and what it means to actually be a man. Jiraiya could have gone back to the village with the limited intel that he had and lived on to fight another day. However, as a man, there comes a time where you have to choose to do things that you don't necessarily want to do. Things that will come at the expense of your own well-being because you're acting on behalf of something bigger than yourself. Like for instance, when you're laying in bed with your girl one night and someone breaks into the house, you ain't going to turn over and look at her and say, hey baby, you go check that out. I'll be rooting for you right here. We all about equality, baby. Go check out that robber right there. I give you the moral support. No, you're getting up and you're biting the bullet to get the job done. The same way that Cody Rhodes had to eat the pen at WrestleMania 39 so Roman Reigns could cross a thousand days of his historic championship run despite Cody fans going, whoa, womp womp. What about history? What about the story being finished? Womp womp, gotta wait for WrestleMania 40, fellas. Jiraiya handled business here even though he knew he'd die. But at the very least, he could die knowing he gave solid intel to Konoha that could be used to protect the village in the process, leaving behind a message that only his student Naruto could decode, in short, showing the faith that he was putting in his student to be the one to take down the Akatsuki leader in the future. Jiraiya's death told us not to fear death itself, but instead, when that time comes, we have to embrace death like a long lost friend, which is why seeing this man sinking to the bottom of the ocean with a smile on his face thinking about the title of his next book is always such a joy for me because the man died with a burden being lifted off of his shoulders and a smile on his face despite getting done dirty and how he died at number four we have the deaths of minato and kashina now i'll be biased here and i'll admit my bias naruto volume 53 it remains to this day my absolute favorite manga volume cover so that plays a huge role in this death being this high up with chapters 500 through 504 being some of my absolute favorite chapters in the series because we got to get a look at the birth of Naruto and the death of his parents. This death teaches us the love that parents have for their children while also once again reinforcing the earlier lessons in the manga, which is that tomorrow is not promised to us. We're not owed a tomorrow. Most people, when they hear their child's about to be born, they aren't thinking that their child's gonna grow up an orphan. Yet the cold reality of life is that sometimes there are cases where this isn't the case. You have some women who go into childbirth where the father isn't in the picture and something goes wrong during childbirth and in the process the mother dies sometimes she doesn't even get to hold her child before she dies and if she's lucky she gets to hold the child for a short period before she dies and what i love about this death in particular is that kishimoto highlights this very point with kashina at times in the manga shortly after naruto's born and she has the nine tails ripped out of her body and she's at death's doorstep the first thing that she asks minato after he saves her in chapter 501 is a question asking is naruto okay the way that minato gently sets his wife down on the bed next to naruto and the way that kishimoto draws her face with tears building in the corners of her eye as she looks at naruto and then right when the tears look like they're about to start coming out she says his name she grabs his head and he places naruto's face and head against her eye and minato is shown looking with a pained expression likely knowing this is the last time that his wife will ever hold her child. It hits you right in the gut. What should have been a lifetime of great memories, it was reduced to a matter of heartbreaking moments, which gets even more heartbreaking when you realize that Naruto technically did not have to grow up as an orphan, which brings us to another lesson that we can take away from Minato and Kashina's death, 
which is as a man there comes a time where you have to do things that might sacrifice your own dreams and desires. It's fitting when you think about it because in a way Minato and Jiraiya both died teaching the same lesson and both gave their life and trust in the future of the village to Naruto. In chapter 503 Kashina tells Minato that she would take the nine tails with her to death and when Minato hears this we get the heartbreak on his face as he realized what this means and he realizes what she's saying as she's babbling on about her regrets about not seeing naruto grow up and minato tells her he's gonna steal the remaining chakra into naruto and that he's gonna use the reaper death god to seal half a Kurama into himself and then use the eight trigram seal to put Kashina's remaining chakra and Kurama's chakra into naruto minato he could have been selfish here his son needed him. He could have picked his son before his village, just as Naruto did when tasked with killing Boruto in Boruto episode 220. But Minato saw the bigger picture. His duty to the village as Hokage came before his desires to be a father to Naruto. The balance of power between nations would be upset and if there was no Jinchurik in the village, there was no guarantee Kurama would actually respawn inside the land of fire and be subdued by Konoha and sealed inside of another Jinchurik. There was no guarantee that the village would ever be around when that happened, but at least with this one action, even if it cost him a lifetime with his son, he could guarantee his village's future in more ways than one. Minato doing such a thing for Konoha, it really hits me in the heartstrings every time I see this because you can only imagine what was running through his mind. On what should have been the happiest day of his life, his wife was dying. He was preparing to die himself. He was having to choose between being a father and being a Hokage, and he was about to force his child to endure the burden of being a Jinchuriki knowing full well that it would likely lead to a lifetime of isolation and hatred, but he had to do what he was called upon as Hokage to do. Being honest, if I was in that same situation, I might have done what Naruto did with Boruto. I wouldn't have been able to choose the lives of others over the chance to spend what time I had left with my child. Yet in spite of all of this, Minato stood on business and died with a smile on his face without any regrets, despite knowing that he spent the next 17 years of his life battling the Nine Tails inside the Reaper Death God, or at the very least, that's what we were led to believe until we learned that Minato, being such the chat that he is, he tamed Kurama, and they were just sitting there in the belly of the Reaper with Minato placing a collar around Kurama's neck telling him to stop growling so Minato could get some sleep. At number three, we're gonna be going with Itachi Uchiha's death, and this one is interesting for a few different reasons. When you get to this death in Naruto Volume 43, you go, okay, awesome, Sasuke, he just avenged his clan. Yay, let's go. So sure, there might've been a few things that Itachi was hiding, that much was clear, but whatever. We saw him kill his clan, this dude's gotta go, he's the absolute worst. However, it's when Obito starts telling Sasuke the truth about Itachi that your heart begins to plummet, or at least my heart began to plummet. You know, I actually have a heart. Itachi lives matter. Obito says, hey, this guy, he killed his lover, who we learned later on was Izumi Uchiha. Hey, this guy killed his parents, Fugaku and Mikoto. He killed his comrades and his relatives of the Uchiha clan. He got backed into a corner by the elders and tasked with an impossible situation where Fugaku wasn't gonna listen to anything Hiruzen had to offer even if Itachi went to Heroes and said, hey, they about to blow up the village and they about to do all this crazy stuff. Donzo wants me to kill the Uchiha clan. It wouldn't have mattered. Heroes and could not have changed Fugaku's mind. It's then that you see that Itachi, like so many other shinobi, he was a tool used by his village. He was a tool used and discarded like so many shinobi who were cogs in the shinobi system that desperately needed to change. Itachi died with regrets. We learn as much when he's reunited with Sasuke during the war, realizing that there was still one more card that he could have played to try to avoid the Uchiha massacre, which is that instead of not trusting Sasuke with the truth, he should have treated him like an adult despite both of them still being children and used him to change the mind of his father to get Fugaku to stand up against the rest of the clan. Maybe it would have worked. Maybe Fugaku was too far gone at that point. We'll never know. However, the point is, is that Itachi's regrets show in the years afterwards that he thought about what his 12 year old self could have done differently, which yes, Itachi was 12 during the Uchiha massacre. However, the point is, is that Itachi's regrets show on the night of the Uchiha massacre. Itachi at the very least thought about what he could have done differently. It probably crossed his mind when he returned to the village at age 17, after the death of the third Hokage. The lesson that we can take away from Itachi's death is that yes, 
There are times where we leave this world with regrets, but there are also things outside of our control. Itachi thought that he could come up with a whole Batman level contingency plan in the process, a foolproof way to get exactly what he wants. Either Sasuke willingly returns to Kona as a hero following his death and he protects the village, or Sasuke takes Itachi's eyes, he confronts Naruto, Shisui's crow pops out of Naruto and forces Sasuke to return to Konoha with the intention to protect the village via the Koto Matsukami Genjutsu. Itachi was willing to take away his brother's free will for both what he believed would be best for his brother Sasuke as well as for the village itself. And yet, as an Edo Tensei, Itachi learned the hard way even the best laid plans, they can be blown up because life throws curveballs that we don't account for. Nowhere in Itachi's big brain equations did he think that he would actually be brought back as an Edo Tensei. The other lesson we can take away from Itachi's death is that we aren't ever truly out of options, which is something that he realized after the massacre because he could have used Sasuke by his own words. In the Itachi Shinden story of Midnight, we learned that Itachi wrestled with the decision to massacre the clan, standing on the cliff crying where Shisui died, despite knowing that Obito was watching him from the shadows as an unrevealed presence. He openly said to himself if Shisui were alive, he would have been able to physically stop him from going through with his plan to massacre the village, but all but admitting that he wished that Shisui was still there to stop him. The anime does do a good job of trying to show some of Itachi's breakdown in episode 455 by changing things, by having him drop onto his knees after the massacre is over and after obito leaves them that was a nice touch but that's anime only however as is often the case when we are going through something in real life we don't see all the moves we have left to make in times of a situation because we're human we make decisions at times based off of our emotions not based off of logic emotions cloud our judgment in ways that they wouldn't otherwise do it's part of a heartbreaking journey that we take during our run in this marathon that we call the human experience. And that's okay. Sometimes those emotional decisions, they lead to better outcomes. And sometimes they lead us to making decisions that haunt us up into the moments of our deaths, which is gonna be a good segue into the next death on this list. At number two, we're gonna be going with Obito Uchiha. Now Obito is an interesting case here because had the guy just gotten smashed and half by the boulder that would have been worthy enough to end up on this list even though he would have been lower down the list towards the bottom on top of giving kakashi the shine gun this dude's literally sitting there being crushed to death and having his rival run off with his childhood crush which jesus that takes being in the friend zone to the maximum however it's after we learn that obito is alive and has been behind so much of the terrible misdeeds and misfortune that have befallen Naruto in the greater Naruto world that start setting the stage for Obito's death. Here, we had a guy who was written as somewhat of a parallel to Naruto, basically showing us that this is what would have happened had Naruto gone the wrong way, theoretically, and we saw Obito purposely trying to break Naruto constantly throughout their battle in the fourth ninja war as if to prove to himself that the outcome that he experienced was the only possible outcome for someone like he and Naruto. We learned that Obito was the one who was basically responsible for Naruto growing up an orphan and that gets even more heartbreaking when you go into the Ninja Escapades OVA that the Naruto series creator Masashi Kishimoto wrote where Kashina in her section of the OVA basically alludes to her and Minato being Obito like a son and she flat out says she wants their unborn child to grow up with a kind, joyful, unwavering spirit like Obito's. It makes that moment in chapter 502 in Naruto where Obito takes Kashina and basically sentences her to death on the day of her child's death the very child that she wanted to be like Obito by extracting the nine tails from her body. And fast forward 17 years later, and Naruto's using that very same power to beat back Obito and eventually defeat him. And to add to the poetry in that moment, Minato even says that Naruto pretty much gave him a talking to that reminded him of something that Kashina would have said. Almost as if for Kishimoto to say that Kashina was coming from beyond the grave to scold Obito's for his actions. Talking sense into him that Ren would have hated the current version of Obito who was standing before him, which that ends up setting the stage for Obito's redemption in a major way. It all leads us to that moment where Obito, after getting brought back from what he literally tells us is death in Naruto Volume 71, when he's brought back by Naruto in the Ice Dimension, Obito ends up giving his life to protect the very child who he damn near ruined, depending on if you don't want to spin it by saying Obito putting Naruto through 
all of that basically produced the pressure that turned Naruto into a diamond, which as an Obito fan, I will always argue that point until I'm blue in the face. You can't change my mind. Obito's death shows us that no matter how far we've fallen, no matter how much wrong we've done, it's never too late to stop walking down that wrong path make amends and take responsibility for all of your actions however that path it doesn't always lead to us being given a second chance and a slap on the wrist like sasuke and kabuto and orochimaru sometimes the price that we have to pay is a steep one but in this case obito when he died went out like the hero who we were introduced to way back when kakashi tells team seven early on in chapter eight of the manga that the names carved into the marker are the heroes of the village who had died one of those names being a person he called his best friend obito even without us hearing his name at that point and us not even hearing his name until after the third hokage died and kakashi is met at the gravestone by one of the anbu asking was he visiting obito again he was being built up as a hero and he actually died as a hero even after dying he still found a way to contribute by having his chakra leave the ashes of his body and physically fly into kakashi's body via some chakra mumbo jumbo to give him one last chance to defeat kaguya using the sharingan and obito's own six pass chakra before he returned to the afterlife to spend time with ren showing that sometimes the things that we wanted the most they don't come to us until we own up to our own mistakes and bad karma that we accumulated in the past obito wanted ren's heart and he goes off into the afterlife to spend forever with her knowing that throughout it all she was watching him the entire time and she never gave up on him naruto said that ren would have hated the current obito who tried to forcefully create a world where ren would exist again and after he acknowledged his wrongs he became someone who ren could actually care for by being the obito who died as a hero it's one of the most beautiful turns for a character in the series and it's something I go over in extensive detail in my Obito Uchiha video essay I have on the channel. So if you want a super in-depth look at Obito's character, make sure to check out that video. Now, finally, at number one, we're going to be going with Kurama's death in Boruto episode 218. This one probably will come as a surprise to those of you who are people who have kept up with my Boruto manga reviews. Because during the manga chapter review for this one, I absolutely hated Kurama's death. I hated how it was handled in the manga. I do appreciate what Ikimoto tried to do with it artistically and what Kishimoto tried to convey with the dialogue, but I let it be known. I was extremely unfulfilled with that chapter. However, this is one of those rare moments where I prefer what the anime gave us over the manga. Boruto episode 218 is legitimately the only Boruto episode that made me shed a tear. The way that that goodbye of Naruto and Kurama was handled, the way that the music dropped from the outro as the Bijuu gathered around to say goodbye, and the transition from Naruto reaching for Kurama to Boruto grabbing Naruto's hand, it remains the one death in the Naruto franchise I've legit watched over 10 times, which is huge. You guys know I do not prefer to watch anime to enjoy a story i prefer to read the manga but holy this one was done way too well in the anime kurama dying in the way that he did against such an unstoppable force in ishiki it was something that was well earned a great payoff it felt like a proper way to send off such a beloved character but what i enjoy the most about this death and the reason that i have it at number one is that it teaches us the lesson of love and understanding to use a wrestling reference kurama is basically a super hot heel i.e the bad guy who ends up turning babyface i.e the good guy and he becomes an even bigger star as a heel than he ever was as a bad guy naruto as a franchise teaches us in various ways the concept of love but also the value that comes from seeking mutual understanding from those that we have disagreements with and i think it's something that karama's death really drives home the value that comes from finding understanding and those who we initially bore grudges against karama reflecting on naruto's lifetime seeing in the various stages of his life before he died it's a great example of that the fact that the very thing that was the source of so much of naruto's trauma in his lifetime ended up being the very thing that saves his life using a power that can only be made possible via the enormously strong 
connection that comes from Naruto and Kurama, it is poetic. No other Jinchuriki has the relationship that Naruto have with Kurama. The closest you could argue is Killer Bee and the Eight Tails, and that's not even close. For an immortal being such as Kurama to give up his life to save Naruto, that is huge because he's trading in literal immortality. Biju, they die, but then they respawn. They don't truly ever die. They're a representation of the same sex cycle of life, death, and rebirth, and yet Kurama gave all that up for a man who he never wanted to be sealed inside of when he was a newborn. What I also love about this moment is that Naruto was finally free from being a Jinchuriki, something that for decades was viewed as a burden, it was viewed as a curse, and yet Naruto had never fully looked more miserable in this one moment when he realized that Kurama died than he did throughout any moment he suffered as a Jinchuriki. Pick whatever trauma moment that Naruto had as a Jinchuriki. It don't match the hurt look when he realizes Kurama died. It speaks volumes to the power of love, and I think that that's a fitting place to end this video.